In lecture one, we're going to look at the different types of studies and introduce sampling theory. Now that you've posed your research question, you need data. And to collect data, you need to formulate a study. So we're going to look at the various types of studies that are available to you. Studies are designed to collect information or data to answer your research question. Broadly speaking, there are two types of studies, an observational study and an experimental study. So as the name implies with an observational study, you as the researcher are simply observing. You're observing and measuring some specific characteristic for units in your population. So they could be people, animals. You are simply observing them and recording that characteristic. For example, a survey is an, an example of an observation study. You're simply posing questions, whether it's in person or the survey sent by email. The person answers the questions, but you're not interfering, okay? You're just observing. In contrast, an experimental study is where you as a researcher are applying some influence over the people, animals, or units that are being studied. For example, an example of an experimental study is a clinical trial. You could be giving some drug and seeing how it impacts a person's um, ability to recover from some illness. To contrast the difference between an observational study and an experimental study, let's consider the example in the image below. Say we're interested in the relationship between regularly working out and energy level. On the left hand side, we have an example of an observational study, and on the right hand side, we have an experimental study. On the left hand side with the observational study, let's say we sample two types of people from a population, those who choose to work out and those who do not. We find the energy levels for, two group, for the two groups and we compare. So this is an observational study because we're just observing the people that work out their energy level and those that don't work out on the en and their energy level. We're not asking them to change their habits. Whereas on the right hand side with the experimental study, in this case, let's say we take a sample from the entire population. We randomly assign people from that sample into two groups. In the first group, we ask those people to work out regularly. And in the second group, we tell them do not work out regularly. So we as the researcher there are controlling the, this experiment because we're telling group one to actively work out and group two to not work out. So this is the difference, a clear difference between an observational study and an experimental study. Let's look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of observational and experimental studies. And these are things to keep in mind when you design your own studies. Neither one is perfect for all types of situations, but in certain situations, one type of study may be more beneficial than another. The first advantage of an observational study is that it may require less resources and or time. This is in contrast to an experimental study that may require more resources and or time because you have to design the experiment, set up the experiment, run the experiment, monitor it. Second advantage of an observational study is that there are less ethical concerns because you're just monitoring something, you're not changing it. Whereas with an experimental study, there could be ethical concerns. Say you're doing a clinical trial, you have to be careful how the people, animals, or otherwise are being um, impacted as a result of the study. Moving on to the disadvantages, and I'm going to compare these two disadvantages of an observational study with these advantages of an experimental study. So disadvantages of an observational study are lack of control and less validity as it is difficult to determine causality. Because you're doing an observational study, as the researcher, you're observing something naturally happening without intervening. So it may be difficult to show a cause and effect relationship between the variables of interest. Let us consider the example of smoking. As a researcher, when you're monitoring people, say smoking over a period of time, you tend to not be intervening. 
So you do not control the outcome of that study, such as you're not controlling things like smoking duration, other lifestyle factors. So it could be you, you don't have that control and you, it's harder to determine that causality. Whereas in an experimental study, you do have more control. You, because you're controlling the experiment, you can have more validity and causality can be determined. The final disadvantage of an observational study is observer and participant bias. So in an observational study, your intention is not to influence the study, but you may inadvertently do that. For example, consider a teacher in a classroom and the teacher is interested in student participation. To evaluate this, they're going to record the time spent by students taking notes. Now, the issue with this is that the students may feel pressure to overperform given that the teacher is recording their behavior. So this is an example of study where you have inadvertently influenced the participant's behavior. Now we will consider the different types of observational and experimental studies available. Firstly, we have a, what's called a cross-sectional study. So this is where some data point is observed, measured or recorded at one point in time. So for example, in the graph below on the left, we have a population and we record some characteristic of that population at one point in time, say obesity level. Next, we have a longitudinal study, which in contrast to a cross-sectional study is where some data is collected, measured or recorded at more than one point in time. So for example, below we have our population and there's some characteristic in that population that is recorded at three different periods of time. Next, we have a retrospective study. And this is where data is collected from the past, for example, information from historical interviews. So you as a researcher are looking back, getting that information. A prospective study then is the opposite. That's where the data is collected over time from the present moving forward. So you might collect data at various times in the future. Next, I want to introduce the idea of sampling and sampling theory. So the idea of sampling is relatively straightforward. You have some population, so say a large group of people, and you're interested in recording some characteristic of individuals in the population. But due to say time constraints or other resource constraints, you may not be able to record that characteristic of everyone in the population. The population could be too big. So then what you do instead is you take a representative sample, a subset from that population. And that subset or sample is going to give you information about the entire population. And this is the whole basis of statistical inference. You take a representative sample from the population and from that sample, you infer some quantity associated with the population. So researchers rarely survey the entire population. Imagine it yourself, you're trying to do some research study here. It's going to be very difficult, let's say, if you're dealing with a big population to get information from every person in that population. There's a high cost associated with dealing with a full entire population. And the population is also dynamic. It can change over time. So the disadvantages of dealing with a population, they are contrasted with the advantages of sampling. Sampling had, tends to have a lower cost. Data is faster to collect. And because you're dealing with a smaller data set, it's possible to improve the accuracy and quality of the data if needed. You could increase your sample size, say. Next, I'm going to introduce some key sampling terminology, some of which we've already mentioned. And these are terms that if you do any statistics course, you will encounter. Firstly, we have the population, which is the entire group being studied. For example, population of all adults on electoral register. A sample is a subset 
of that population. So in this case, a subset of adults on the electoral register. A unit, that's just say one person in this example, an individual from the uh, population. A sampling frame is simply a list of all the individuals that make up the population. And finally, a variable is a characteristic of interest for each unit. So that's going to vary depending on which person or unit you're dealing with. In this example, that could be, say, the political party a person will vote for. Over the next two slides, I want to compare a parameter with a sample statistic. So both a parameter and a statistic are numerical quantities that describe something. In the case of a parameter, it's a numerical measure that describes some characteristic of the population. It could be the mean, it could be a proportion associated with the parameter. The way I like to remember it is, think of parameter, begins with P and so does population. Now a parameter, it's a fixed number. We have our population, say the mean height of all people in a population. It's a fixed number, but in practice, we will never know it unless we ask or monitor everyone in the population. So to estimate a population parameter, which we do not know, the best alternative is to take a sample and use that sample to infer what the population parameter is. Another example could be the percentage of all adults who will vote for a political party. That's again a parameter because it's a value coming from the entire population. But in practice, we will never know it because we can't go out and ask, everyone's, um, ask everyone what political party they will vote for. In contrast, a statistic has to do with a sample. So again, the S is there for statistic and sample. So it's a numerical measure describing some characteristic of a sample. So it could be sample mean, sample proportion. Now the big difference between a statistic and a parameter, with a parameter, in theory, we'll never know. In a statistic, we do know, because we're dealing with a smaller quantity of units. We can monitor that or record that characteristic for each unit and work out the corresponding statistic. A statistic does change from sample to sample because you're, you have a different set of units. And ultimately the statistic is something that's used to estimate what the population parameter is. And that's the basis of, basis of statistical inference and hypothesis tests and confidence intervals. We'll talk about hypothesis tests later in this course. So I've hinted at this in the previous slides, but why do we sample? Consider the example on the right hand side where we have a sur survey of 35,000 people where it was found that almost a third said they'd postponed their medical appointments during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, in this case, a sample had to be taken because we cannot go out to everyone in the population who had a medical treatment and ask them, did you postpone or not? So the best alternative is to run a survey on a sample, okay, a representative sample of the population. But there are several questions we need to consider about this approach when we take a sample of a population. And some of the questions we should consider when sampling is, how do we actually get the sample from the population? And what is the correct way to do that? Is there an incorrect way? So what mistakes can we make when we're selecting that sample? And the big thing is, we take our sample from the population, but is it representative of the population? Because if it, if it isn't, the subsequent analysis is not going to make sense. So these are some of the things we're going to consider in the next lecture where we actually look at how you sample incorrectly and correctly.